I've got lots of things up here because I've got old. Right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So this morning, I'm going to continue with our series of messages going through Revelation. You're going to hear a different voice today. It's been Steve so far. So you're going to have me, which is always entertaining. Uh, I don't know what you thought when we were going to do a Revelation, but it probably wasn't the same as me. When I got the uh, email, said I was going to preach on it. Uh, so I'm there going, hmm, interesting. Uh, how are you finding it? Can be a bit confusing. You know, like there's a bit of silence there. It can be like that. Revelation can be like that. It can be very confusing. There's lots of stuff, uh, weird symbolism and stuff like that. And um, I'm not even going to pretend that I understand half of it myself. Not even going to pretend it. Um, but I really do think that God has given me something for you today. And I'm trying to try and do my best to, uh, to bring that across. I usually invite Angela to come and, and read out because I'm not the best of readers. But it does say it's there right in front of us in Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So I am going to read it and I'm going to invite a blessing on myself and for you. So, because I've got old, I'm going to have to change glasses. These are my reading specs. It's going to appear up here. There we go. So, I'm going to be reading from Revelation 3, verse 7 to 22. It's the last two uh, churches that John writes to. So, here we go. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. What, open, what he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews, but they are, they are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong, who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that you, no one can take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of God and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city, city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and the true witness. The beginning of God's creation. I know the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I will wish you, I wish that you were one or the other. Not, but since you are lukewarm water, White on water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. 
and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be ashamed of your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with my, me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. That is the word of God. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, I really do pray that whatever you've got for us this morning is truly of you and not of me, and that we learn more about the book of Revelation. Amen. Okie okay, I will change my glasses, mate. Right? Father's Day. I'm not sure I can follow the video. I'm not sure I can follow Reuben, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but I had a feeling that I have preached on Father's Day before. I know I definitely preached on it last week, last year, uh, because we were on Zoom. We were all in little boxes, and I know it was Father's Day when I were preaching because my children weren't with me. Uh, their stepdad had got COVID and they couldn't come. So I was ranting. And I even did part of it with a bag on my head. Uh, it's still on the website. I encourage you to look at me ranting with a bag on my head. So go and, go and have a look at that and have another laugh. It's quite funny. Um, I have done, it's, I think the third or fourth preach I've done on Father's Day, which is amazing really. I looked it up and I've, I think I've done 19 preaches over the time that I've been pre standing up here. And that's in seven years. Seven years, 19 preaches. When I got that email, I'm there going, am I good enough? Am I good enough to preach on Revelation? That was the first thing that came into my head. But I know God is gracious. So what do I think he's got for us today? I'll start with Father's Day, because that's where I seem to preach most often. Have you noticed that there's the Father's character, apart from throughout this book, in these seven letters? We haven't done them all. Uh, I was given the last two. But each one has got the Father's character in it. A bit of encouragement here and a telling off there. That's, what has, that's what's been coming through. I certainly don't do the video. <laughs> I don't think any father in this room does the video. We are all sort of trying to encourage our children to do the right thing. When the kids, my kids, I've got two children, Ryan and Keris. Uh, Ryan is currently doing his A-levels and he, you know, doing his, um, what's the word, revision. And Keris is doing a mocks. So they're at home. Um, but when they were little, I used to take them swimming. I used to take them swimming, and little by little, armbands off, rings off, so they could swim an entire length. I really wanted them to do that. And I gave a little incentive to Ryan. He's 18 now. This was when he was about five or six. I would buy him a new Power Ranger outfit if he could swim a length without armbands. 
Go on, Steve. <laughs> he did it. That's him. We're in it. When I showed it him yesterday, he's there going, Rawr! You're not going to put that in front of everybody. And I really wanted the older youth to be in because they know Ryan. And they will be laughing now. And I'll have to show them after. But yeah. For Ryan, it was a new Power Ranger outfit. That's what it was for him. He wanted for me to be proud of him as well. Like he'd done it. He'd done this, this swim. And yeah, I am proud of him and I'm still proud of him. But that is not the reason I gave him an incentive of a Power Ranger outfit. The real reason I did that was to save his life. That's the real reason I, I wanted him to swim. That's the real reason that I wanted him to have an incentive. Because his mum used to take him on a holiday abroad. I wasn't there. Swimming pools. If he could get out, if he fell in, if somebody weren't watching, he could get out. He was alive. It was to save his life. And this is what the book of Revelation is. It's a book to save your life. We are all God's children. And we sometimes really don't see the reality of what's going on. We don't have the full perspective in the heavenlies. What's going on in our lives. Like Ryan not knowing why I really wanted him to swim. These seven churches probably thought they were doing all right. We here in CCB think we're probably doing all right. The individuals in these churches thought they were probably doing all right. We think we're probably doing all right. Do you think you're doing all right? But what is the view from heaven? That is why, well, I believe this message today is really about what is the view from heaven? I think it's a major theme of the book of Revelation. And that is what I've called this message. You put that out, see? The view from heaven. I want it to keep coming back to you as we're going through today. What is the view from heaven? Steve has said on a couple of occasions that some people spend a lot of time in Revelation and others tend to avoid it. For me, I don't actively go near it, but I don't stop away from it either. I'm probably like a lot of you. If we're going to preach on it, we'll go and look at it. Rest of the time, we won't look at it. But some people spend an awful lot of time in it. Of all the preaches that I've done, this is the one I've spent the longest thinking about, praying about, researching. And I hope what I've got is going to hold you because it's longer than I've ever done before and we're starting quite late so um, I don't want to cut any of it because I think it's important I'm not a scholar I've never studied theology I've never been on courses I don't read a lot of Christian books but I do know that God is real and he has put it on my heart this morning to try to best explain some of the stuff that's going on in Revelation so that you can understand it. I'm just a working class boy from Accrington. So to begin with, I feel I should just share a couple of things that I think God has shown me that will help you with the rest of this book. 
the things that have made me feel. Uh, that was one of them. And if I get it, hopefully you will. And one of the things this morning when I was in the bath, which is when I was reading through this stuff again, was I want you to be intimate with God. I don't know if your dad ever went and sat you down. But I want to sit down. I want you to be intimate with me about what I'm going to say. First off, don't get too bogged down in the details. There's stuff in there about dates, prophecies, numbers, everything that these things mean. There's a lot of stuff out there. Don't get bogged down in that stuff. They are... Can you pull that switcher up, Steve? Not that one. The one about Matthew 24. No one knows the day or hour when these things happen not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. All the theories that anybody writes, what a lot of gum bum bunk them. Jesus doesn't know when all this stuff's going to happen. So how are we? Is he going to tell you or is he going to tell me? Or is he going to tell them? He hasn't told Jesus. Yeah? Just keep it simple. Don't get confused. Don't start looking for signs. I did once. Last year. I even phoned Stephen Savannah up about it. You know? Pandemic. I'm sat there looking at, look at, the, looking at the sky for Jesus coming back for a full day. I thought it was going to happen. There's been world wars. There's still going to be wars. There's a war going on right now. One of the world wars ended up with a nuclear bomb with 10,000 people dying. The world is still spinning. Only God knows. Have faith. Trust God. Yeah? The other thing that I believe God wants me to share and help you understand is about all the confusing language. This is what I struggled with. Angels, trumpets, dragons, scrolls, people eating scrolls. Weird animals with wings and lies and all that sort of stuff. What's going on? Remember this book is a series of visions that John was experiencing. In effect, he was taken up to heaven. And he was doing his very best to explain what he was seeing. Yeah? So, just for a moment, put yourself in his shoes. Try to explain something. Okay then. You all know what a lion looks like, yeah? If you don't know what a tiger is, and you never know its name, and you, you're asked to describe a tiger, you'll go, stripe a lion. Yeah? That makes sense? Describe an armadillo to me, Damien. Giant woodlife with a long nose. Do you know what I had? Best thing I could come up with was armor plated, long nosed Hoover of ants. Okay? Do you see John's problem? He's seeing stuff that is not on earth. He's trying to describe things that are on earth 
with things that are not on earth. That's his point of reference. He's trying to convey it to you. That's why none of it makes sense. It hasn't got a name, this thing. It's not been seen on earth before. So he's doing his best to try to describe it. Others have been taken to heaven. Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah. They're all trying to do the best. Trying to explain what they're seeing. The situations that are there. Because these are heavenly things. Which we have no contact with. You know, we can't understand it. So what we've got is somebody's doing their best. And remember that this stuff was written in old Hebrew. Yeah? Have you ever tried talking to a Geordie or a, or, or, or a Glaswegian? Have you ever tried talking to somebody like my granddad? This is a book. Lancashire English. Okay? Randomly. What does this mean? Anything there to be here. What does mangy mean? Bad tempered. Manky scruffy. Heard that one. Molt. That means stressed, apparently. Me more. To pull faces. Moggy off. Get lost. Mourn means tomorrow. Murps. Have you heard of what murps are? You know what murps are? Murps are marbles, apparently. We come from Lancashire, most of us. We don't understand any of it. And it's still within our living generation, yeah? And we don't understand it. So we've got to try and understand what John's going on about. Yeah? The best translators in the world have had a go at it. Okay? Does that make any kind of sense to you? Yeah? I hope so. Because I have got a great deal of sympathy with John. Because I've got to try and explain this the next two <laughs> books, next two letters in the Bible. Okay, that's my little father a bit done, I can stand up. So, I'm going to go along with it and go... I've got two main points. What is the view from heaven? And how God saves the saved. Okay? Jesus wrote this to the seven churches. It was not written to unbelievers. We have to be aware of that. It wasn't written to the guys out there. It was written to the churches. And it was going to be read in the churches. And it was going to be heard in the churches. It specifically says that. Not letters to individual churches either. They were written as a whole. He links them all with a partial description of himself at the introduction to each letter to each church. In effect, his credentials, his authority to speak into the churches and into their situations. The slide from Turkey, please, Steve. It was there. You've seen it once. Slide from Turkey, Steve. Have you got it? That's it. Steve has already talked to us about this, this area. Jesus was writing letters to these churches in modern Turkey. He wasn't writing them to Jerusalem. He wasn't writing it to Rome or anywhere else. He was here where he was writing it to. Why? That was a question I wanted to know. Why here, not Jerusalem, not Antioch, not anywhere else, not Rome? It wasn't because 
Paul had written there. He wrote to Ephesus in this first one. But why here? The answer is here too. It's in the letter to Pergamon. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. The letter states that Satan's city and Satan's throne are over there in this region. Wow. If you were here, you could go, Satan's throne and Satan's city is in Preston. I could have said Burnley, but I'm a Burnley fan. I didn't want him to laugh. I couldn't bring myself to say it. So I said Preston. If you were in Blackburn, Satan's throne is in Preston. That's why he's writing these letters to this lot. Because the entire region is under the influence of Satan. They need help. Bad stuff crept into these churches. No surprise, is it? And probably went unnoticed. Jesus wants to address this. Prepare them for what is to come and ultimately save them. What about these last two churches? What is the view from heaven? So, okay, I want you to imagine yourself, okay? You're in Philadelphia. And a letter from the Apostle Paul, Apostle John, He's being read out. You've got to be excited, haven't you? This guy was with Jesus. The letters are read out in order. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Theatara, and Sardis. It's your turn. Can you imagine what they're thinking? After what's gone before all the stuff that they've had, he's had a, a go a pop at. What's he going to say about us? I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. I bet they were relieved. Wouldn't you be relieved? After all the stuff and the telling off that you've already had from all the others no idolatry no Jezebel spirits no compromising lots of good stuff about obedience and perseverance and not denying God looks like the view from heaven is pretty good just a bit weak and feeble I suspect nobody wants to be called weak and feeble. But it's better than the other one. They probably thought. Because I would have done that. Comparison. I believe that is a trap. It's a trap for churches. They're bigger than us. They've got a better worship, better preaching, better this. People, individuals, oh, they've got a better car, a better house, a better life. Better than them. We're doing all right. Not great. It's a trap. It seems that if you look really closely, Jesus has opened the door for them. And it looks like they haven't gone through it. I've opened the door for you. 
You didn't need any strength to open it either. Philadelphia was small, no outreach, even though it was built in a frontier area on the central plateau of modern Turkey. The whole reason Philadelphia was there was to protect the region from barbarians and to spread the Greek and culture and language. So what about the church? What was it spreading? I've opened the door for you guys. You're weak and feeble and you haven't done out. What about us? That's the challenge. Are we walking through the doors that God's opened for us? Or is it only Steve and Lisa doing it? Are we just standing back and watching them go? Clapping and supporting, but not going through any ourselves? Carlos, Fridays. New Day fundraiser next week. Bring some cash. But what else are you doing? How much stuff has gone in the food bank this morning? Did anybody bring out? Or is it just let the leadership do it? What was the last spiritual door you as an individual you walk through? Or is there always a reason for you not to do it? Telling off for the way you up. Spiritual doors. But what happens if an individual shuts the door to Jesus? What if a church does it? Adios here. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. I suspect you've heard that scripture many times. But in a different context. It's about personal acknowledgement of Jesus. Evangelism. You know, there's a, there's a picture. I think Steve did a preach on it. There's a picture with a no door handle. It's got to be open from the inside. All that sort of stuff. This is the context it was written in. This one. Jesus is walking around the seven churches. That's what he's doing. But he comes to one. That's got his door shut. And he's having to shout and knock to get in. What? What's that about? How has it come to this? How has it come to this? That this church had shut its doors on Jesus. How sad. Why? Another why. Self-sufficiency. That's the reason why Ladiosia did it. Ladiosia was the wealthiest of the seven cities mentioned in these letters. It, had known, it was known for its banking industry, its manufacture of wool garments, its medical school, which made a special eye ointment. If you had a problem with your health, that's where you went. Rich people like to stay alive, don't they? They do everything to stop alive. It was so wealthy that after an earthquake, there's a date somewhere, the emperor said, you don't have to pay any taxes anymore while you rebuild. They went, fine, we're okay, we'll do it with ourselves. Arrogance knew no bounds. The church fell into the same trap as Ephesus and Sardis, caught up in the world so much to such an extent, Jesus was superfluous to them. When Jesus came into my life, I was amazed how specific he was. 
He knew everything about me, what made me tick, what would get my attention. And he used it. So I had nowhere to go. He knows that about you guys as well. It's so apparent in this letter to Laodicea. You see, Laodicea had this problem with its water supply, the lukewarm stuff. Unlike most cities that are built on rivers and harbours, this was built, built on the plain. They had to build an aqueduct to transfer the water to it because it didn't have a name of its own. This place was called Pam. Pam I'm going to try and say it now. Pamukilele. Sounds like an instrument. <laughs> have you paid once? <laughs> and the water came out of that place, oh, which I'm not going to say it now, came out of that place and it was boiling hot because it came through the volcanic rock. Yeah? Absolutely scolding. But by the time it reached where you'll see it, it had cooled down. It was lukewarm. Okay to bathe in, drink, no chance. All the salts had started crystalling out. It had to get cold before it was useful. Jesus knew everything about it, down to every single detail of that, and he used it to try to get their attention. I know the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. If you say, uh, you say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realise how you realise that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Poor water. I'm going to spit you out. So rich with your banking industry and I don't need your emperor stuff. But you're so poor. Good eye ointment, but you can't see anything, you're blind. Wool manufacturer, but you're naked. It's all there. It couldn't be any clearer if he wrote it in big neon signs. Jesus doesn't want robots. We all have free choice. So, what does he say? to these guys in Ladios here. He says, so I advise you, I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will be sh not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. Puts right everything what was wrong with the place in a sentence treasures in heaven gold that it is white garments instead of black the Holy Spirit so you can see take Jesus seriously Instead of indifference, which is not on the slide. Those who are victorious and will sit with me on the, my throne, and just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. I thought about this a lot. Victors, overcomers, conquerors, whatever term you use, Jesus calls each and every church and in each and every member of it to be one, an overcomer, a victor, a conqueror. Remember what I said. Revelation 
is a view from heaven. What are the rewards? What is your Power Ranger outfit? That's what he does with the next bit. He gives you something for your victory. From the letter to Ephesus, remember your first love. And to everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. There you go. That's what you get. From the letter to Smyrna. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. I don't want that. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want a second death. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. From the letter to Pergamon, repent of your sin. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven for you. And I will give it to each one, a white stone, and on this stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. I'm going to get a new name. And it won't be Geoffrey. I don't like Geoffrey. I like Jeff. He does it on purpose every Sunday when I'm doing something. My mum calls me Geoffrey. Oh, I did. Nobody else apart from Gina. Gina, Steve, and my mum. That was it. My dad didn't call me Geoffrey. But I don't think God's going to call me Geoffrey. He's going to call me someone else. Burnley fan. <laughs> from the letter to Theatara. Do not tolerate sin idolatry and immorality and you'll get this to all who are victorious who obey me to the very end to them I will give authority over the, all the nations they will have the same authority I receive from my father and I will give them the morning star can't fancy that and he's warning to Sardis if you do what this if you wake up all who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. This is my son. He's going to say that. This is my daughter. This is my child. If you do this stuff, from the letter to Philadelphia, obey the word and do not deny me. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they will never have to leave it. Do you want to be a pillar? Do you want to be something that can be relied on? Somebody can stand up against you? Are you not one now? Do you want to be one? That's your reward. You'll be a pillar in the temple of God. And what do you see here, the last one? Be zealous. Not lukewarm. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. It's all here in these letters. In fact, it's a new Power Ranger outfit. Go on, Steve. How do you get Revelation and Power Rangers together? That's me, I'm sorry. But there you go. That's what you could look like from the view from heaven. If you do this stuff, not saying it is, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but these are things and gifts that God's got for you if you do this stuff. And it has been my honour to read them out to you. But like I was with Ryan, 
when he was swimming his first length. I was right next to him. And Jesus will be right next to you as you do this stuff. Work through this stuff. Get this stuff. Why? It's the Father's love. He wants to save the saved, which is you guys. To be the best you can be. I think Angela said something about this stuff. I can't remember it, but there's a scripture somewhere where you just don't settle for the minimum. Don't settle. I'm, I'm saved, so that's it. I'm not going to do anything else. You've got all this stuff. The book of Revelation is, is addressed and written to the church. It is, in, it is written to you and me, to the bride of Christ, to the church. So we will be ready. Equipping us now and preparing us for what is to come. One last thing. Anyone with ears must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Listen to the Spirit. There are some prophets in this room. I know there are. We've got to discern what's right. Is it in here? Does it stand up to this? Jesus repeats himself. It's like what he does in the, in, the, in the parables. He says this line. Those that have ears have ears. Listen. Do we have spiritual ears? Or do we go down rabbit holes? Believing stuff that is not real. Beware of the rabbit holes. In conclusion, if we understand that the book of Revelation is the view from heaven, then we will understand it. That is a very different place. In the coming chapters, there'll be things like dragons and beasts and prostitutes and other stuff, which is weird. But I've explained some of that to you. What does that look like on earth? Are we going to see the four men of Apocalypse come round the corner? I doubt it very much. But it, that's the view from heaven of what it is. So that is what John's describing. We have to trust God with this stuff. I don't know what it's going to look like. But we have to be ready. After spending such a long time researching this message, don't let it get too complicated or scary. We are already saved. Do what God asks us to do in these letters. And I've just got one last thing. It's a spoiler, but I think you might already know it. Jesus wins. I'd have probably just took somebody's preach. Jesus wins. I don't know. Hopefully I've held you. Hopefully I've explained it well enough to, for you to understand this morning. I really pray that I hopefully have done that. So let's just pray. Yes, Lord. Um, the view from heaven. There are amazing, amazing things that we're about to discover as we continue this. The throne room and various other stuff which is majestic. And there are other stuff that isn't. I pray this morning that we have learned stuff. We can get a new Power Ranger outfit. We can, we can be the best Christian we can be. 
and you're going to help us do that. So in Jesus' name, I commit this preach to you and to everybody in this room. Amen.